Hello and welcome to the Creativity Conference's official podcast. My name is Aidan Road. I am the assistant manager here at the Creativity Conference. And in this podcast, I will be exploring all aspects of creativity with some world-class creative minds who we are lucky enough to have joining us as speakers for the conference. Today, I'm joined by Michael Bernier, who is the lead creative designer for the Bernier Design Group in Los Angeles and has been working on creating incredible architectural masterpieces for the last 25 years and more. Michael, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Thanks. You mm. delivered a, a wonderful presentation for us uh, for the online iteration of the Creativity Conference back in August. Uh, I understand that you also had COVID at the time of your presentation. So bonus kudos for that. Um, how did you find the conference despite being unwell at the time? Did you manage to go to any other sessions? I did. Uh, and in fact, I watched a couple, uh, the ones before me, just to kind of get myself warmed up and in the right headspace. Uh, but I, I have to, I have to say, yeah, it was, it, it was very challenging because, uh, uh, just a, a few days before that actually it was closer to a week before that is when I started to feel sick. And even though I know what I wanted to talk about, I had not yet fully written my formal talk. And uh, with with the illness, uh, I was not able to string together a coherent sentence. And I started to get really worried. It's like, what? how, how am I going to do this? I came very close to, uh, to contacting Maxim and saying, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to do this. And um, thank goodness I have a, a coach who the night before basically said to me, you know, look, you know what to say, just, you know, just go on there and talk. <laughs> I know that sounds simple, but that's basically what happened. Uh, it was, it was challenging to say the least. Well, it didn't come across on camera. I watched back the, the replay the other day and I thought it was a, a really excellent presentation. So oh, um, thank you. Appreciate it is that. up on our, our Vimeo library and our YouTube channel. If, if anybody wants to, to watch it as well, I'll put it in the description. Um, Thank so you. what does creativity as an architect slash designer mean to you as a concept? Uh, well, that's a good question because uh, um, I actually started my career. Well, actually, the first the first step in my career many years ago was in fashion, um, not high fashion, but like sportswear. Um, I, I grew up here in Southern California, which is basically the mecca of surf and skate, skate and snowboard. And I was a designer for that that era. Because, you know, when I when I was a kid, I just liked to draw. I just wanted to draw. That's all I did. And I had no idea what kind of career <laughs> that was going to become. Um, and uh, rather than talking about this for two hours, basically, uh, I kind of ran my course with that and somehow ended up in marketing and advertising. And uh, I had an epiphany uh, close to 20 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, where I just realized this is not what I want to be using my creative energies for because i mean for numerous reasons but mostly just uh i didn't like the idea of telling people to buy more stuff you know and uh i had a very very large um uh high high fructose carbonated corn syrup uh client that i just felt no longer needed my services so anyway long story short i uh i want to do something that felt more like i was making a difference and i discovered landscape architecture so what was interesting was even though there was a, there was a lot of technical things I had to learn and understand about uh, land and plants and how it all works together, uh, I found that my previous career as a designer, uh, the, the principles are basically the same. I mean, if you truly understand design principles, you can design a chair, a car, a T-shirt or a landscape. Um, and again, obviously, there's technical parts to each one of those things that you have to understand. Um, but I basically said, OK, I'm going to do this. And I went back to school and learned uh, learned what I could. But uh, I actually got very impatient and didn't finish and just started my own business and just jumped in and figured I would I would learn as I go. Um, but the uh, to, to sort of answer, uh, try to answer your question more specifically, what what I did learn as a designer uh, in, in, in marketing and creativity was how people respond to things. And, uh, you know, I think that there's two aspects to creativity. There's what's inside of you that wants to come out and then there's how it's received. So you can't control how it's received. You can only control what you do. And I think 
that's one of the key distinctions between art and design. Art is like, hey, world, this is my creation. Um, I either care or don't care what you think about it. Um, but design is specifically, okay, what am I going to create that can affect uh, a certain you know, narrative and a certain group of people? And as a marketing creative director, I had to understand that very well. And uh, how that translated into what I do now, where I'm designing uh, landscapes for uh, both residential and commercial properties, is um, I, I really tap into what the client wants. And I get a full understanding of what it is that they're looking for. And most of the time, because I've been doing this for so long, I know what they want more than they do. You know what I mean? And uh, uh, in a sense, like I think it was Steve Jobs that said, people don't know what they want. You have to show them. And I, I, I take that very seriously, very literally, because I can listen to what they want. And again, that's another skill I learned as a creative director is how to really listen and get an understanding of the big picture. And, uh, uh, and then I actually tell the client what they want and I show them and then I get them excited about it and we go to town on the, on the rest of it. So, uh, that's, that, that's, that's how I've, I've sort of evolved into how I do creativity uh, in what I do now. So in that degree, to what extent does psychology, like human brain function, uh, impact on your decisions there? Because you're sort of analyzing, you're like, what what do they actually want? Wow. Um, I am the furthest thing from a psychologist. But, <laughs> yeah. uh, but you know, I, in doing a lot of personal development work, I, I, I have studied and understand what motivates people. And um, one of the very basic ones I've learned is that people make decisions based not on their logical brain, but their uh, their emotional brain. And so when I'm um, when I'm tapping into what they want, I'm always leaning towards the emotional side um, <laughs> and budget. When it comes to budgets, that usually brings everything back to the logical side. But my, my first uh, goal, my, the thing that I focus on is, is to get them dreaming get them excited, get them in their emotional side. And in fact, I just got an email this morning where uh, the client just gave a green light on a project and um, it's, it's not a cheap project. And, you know, I, she, she's actually a classic example of, I listened to what she told me and I made sure the design executed everything that she was looking for uh, and desired and then some, and I got her so excited. She was at the point where it's like, yeah, I you know, $150,000, whatever. Let's go. Let's do it. So um, there's a lot of sales in that as well. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, it's uh, it's definitely something I wasn't able to do 20 years ago. That's for sure. <laughs> right. And I imagine part of that emotional side of the brain tapping into that is is telling a story with with design. To what? How do you do that? How do you tell a story with architecture? Oh, that's a good one. Um, well, you know, that that's that's a really good question because it goes back to what it is I learned as a creative director. Um, when you come up with a concept, when, when there's a problem, it, it always starts with a problem or, or, or something to be solved and uh, a place that you want to get to. And uh, as a creative director, not only did I have to understand that problem and find a solution and and then sell that to the client, but I also had to sell it to my team. So the way to do that is through telling a story. Um, like you, 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 you have to walk them through how this is going to play out. What's the A to Z? What's the, you know, the beginning and the end and the, and ultimately the outcome. And one of the things that I, I learned a lot from in the last agency I worked at was we, we did experiential design, which essentially worked in physical space. It was events and um, promotions. So we would go to a football game, you know, big ones like NCAA and NFL or uh, or even like car races. And we would do these big displays for these products. And my job was how did we get people in there and how do we walk them through and experience the product? So, you know, that's that's one of the things that they talk about in branding is branding is not just your name or your logo. It's the overall experience of your product. So as a, an experiential designer, I was always creating that experience, which essentially is a story. 
you know, what, what when someone walks through this space, how do they interact with everything? And when they're done, what are they left with? What's what's the story that they they have about the brand? Um, so what I learned from that going into uh, to landscape is, you know, you're 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 physically walking through a space. So when someone let's say they start in the kitchen or their bedroom or wherever it is they're going, when they walk out those doors, what it's it's literally it's a story. What story am I going to have them experience? You know, what's the first thing they see? What's and and it's not just visual. Obviously, a lot of it, most of it is visual, but it's uh, smell, you know, with especially with flowers and, and herbs. Um, and what are they going to taste? Maybe maybe we're going to put fruit trees in the backyard. Uh, of course, what are they going to hear? Uh, which means, you know, birds and animals coming into the space, as well as like adding a water feature to uh, to bring a certain you know sound to the space. And, and then they move through that space. And I, I, you know, I always say that uh, um, when you're when you're dealing with a, a space, whether it's large or small, there's two ways to describe how you move through it. And it, one is 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 access. How do you get from point A to point B? And then the other is destinations. You always want to be creating destinations, <clears throat> and then you've got to be aware of the access. So I'm always thinking, where can I create a destination? And that again is the part of the story that's told. So that's. That's one way that I deal with telling a story and psychologically uh, engaging the client into the space. So what makes nature, as you say in your talk, uh, the perfect designer or <laughs> maybe to a greater extent, the greatest storyteller? Yeah, that's a good question, Aiden. Um, and I'm so glad you asked it because that really is the root of the talk that I gave uh, and really what drives me as a designer. Uh, you know, we have to learn certain skills and understand how things work over time. But I was, you know, the seed was planted, pardon the pun, as a, as a child. Uh, I connected with nature very young, uh, working in my garden with my mom and that sort of thing. So I had, a, I had a passion and an understanding for how nature worked at a very young age. And the more that I grew and got older and started to understand how the world works, and especially in the insane world that we're in today, I still go back to nature as telling the best story that, you know, nature is the perfect designer. You just look at a, a leaf and how it's, how it's designed and um, the process of, you know, during the summer when it's hot and we need shade, the trees create a canopy and they create shade. And then winter comes, the leaves fall and, you know, the rain drops or the snow drops right to the ground. And there's, you know, there, there's more sun and more space. And it's just everything is perfect about it. I mean, I literally could talk about this for hours. But the I guess, the, you know, the more that I I need a solution to something, I always look to how nature solved it and find a way to to use that in the, in the design plan. So nature in that sense is sort of the perfect partner of creativity. It, it is it itself is the epitome of creativity because it's it's all around us yes yeah absolutely i mean and that that was really what my talk was about was yeah. uh the, the title was nature of creativity and what i really want to the message i wanted to get across to people was that uh nature is creativity and yeah. we are nature it's in our nature to create so we have the only key thing that keeps us from that is self-doubts limiting beliefs um, and whatever stories we have in our own head about not being able to create anything. But I truly believe that every person has a creative genius inside of them waiting to come out. They just have to find the courage to, to tap into that. Yeah. And nature's working, a guide. <laughs> yeah. Working with nature is obviously something that you, you do a lot. And sustainability is sort of at, at the core of, of what you do. Um, as somebody studying geography and sustainability currently, I have a, a great deal of interest in, in your work and what you do. Oh, I didn't um, know that. That's great. Yeah, it's really it's a really fun subject to, to delve into. So what, from your perspective, as someone who deals with a lot of clients and works on both commercial slash industrial domestic projects, what is the single biggest change, most influential change that an individual can make uh, to their daily lives or to their house 
that can make the most drastic impact on their carbon emissions slash water usage? Oh my gosh. Uh, again, it, that question, we could talk about that for hours. Um, yes. I, uh, I, I've done a lot of study in permaculture and sustainability as well, sustainable design. And, you know, the way the world is currently set up, it's, it's very challenging to, uh, uh, to, to try to be more sustainable. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of small things you can do, everything from using less water to recycling. And there's even big question marks about how recycling works these days. And uh, so I, I would, it, to, to answer the question of what, what is the one thing, for me, it's awareness. Yeah. And I know that sounds simple and very, very broad, but it is because the number one thing that any person can do is just become more aware, more aware of your surroundings, your environment, uh, the way things work. And this goes back to nature. If you, the more you understand, Albert Einstein said it, you know, look into nature and you will understand everything. If you understand how nature works, you will understand our place in nature. When I say our, I mean the human race being part of that ecosystem. And the more awareness that we have around that, the uh, the, the better choices we can make. Uh, it, it, it almost you almost don't even have to know the specifics. You'll just you'll just get it. You'll look at something like when I'm doing a design plan, I always look at every possibility where I can save a tree. Or, or put in permeable, hard, per, permeable hardscape, which means when the, when the rain hits the ground, it goes into the ground rather than running off, which is a big deal here in Southern California because we, we just had some rain yesterday and it was so welcome because we don't normally get rain. Um, but so I would say, you know, just, just become more aware. Make the commitment to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going to become more aware. I'm going to uh, learn to understand these things better, whatever these things are, because it's different for everyone. Uh, the people who are in the tropical rainforest have far different issues than what we have here in Los Angeles or Phoenix or, or you know, Tuscany. Uh, so just just become aware of your environment and then, you know, maybe even do some study, look into some local, uh, you know, uh, programs around sustainable sustainability because they are different for every region, of course. Um, but just make a commitment to be more aware and to care. You know, I think to me, awareness is caring. Uh and um, yeah, when, when you become more aware of your, your impact, you, you use the term carbon footprint. And a lot of people may not know what that means, but that basically means like what, what are us being here and taking steps and living on the planet? What, what's the impact we make and what do we leave behind? If you just can become aware of, wow, I'm in this space. What am I, what am I doing? What's my impact? That alone will change everything. So you have worked on a lot of projects over the years. And yeah. um, actually, before I move on to that, there's certainly no shortage of rain outside my window <laughs> here in England. Um, are are you in very, London? Uh, I'm Manchester. But Man we, uh, that, okay, Manchester, we've got it, yeah. Yeah, we certainly have an abundance here. So we'll try and <laughs> send some your way. Because okay. <laughs> you we need it more than we do. We need it. Um, You've worked on a lot of projects in the past. Are there any designs or projects in particular that you have uh, a bit of a soft spot for, you're particularly proud of, but um, that you wish more people knew about that have sort of gone under the radar? Hmm. Well, um, I think the greatest, there, there's two, two main things that really uh, uh, are, are fulfilling for me at the end of a project. And one is obviously making the client happy. And having them, uh, my ultimate goal with with the the human aspect of what I do is to get them to to connect back to nature, and especially in a place like you know uh, Los Angeles or London or, or Manchester, you know a, a big city, uh, we're not as exposed to nature, and we I think we become very separated from it. So in a very small way, I just want to connect people back to nature, and it's one way to get them to become more aware and uh, understand the bigger picture of things. Um, and I, I, I love when I plant something and immediately nature starts to come in. I've, I, I've sometimes there's been a time where I put a plant in the ground and a hummingbird came in right away and started feeding off of it, butterflies, bees, you name it. So that's all very, very, very satisfying. And I've done, um, 
I've done some projects for some nonprofits like Habitat for Humanity and some uh, some STEM schools here in Los Angeles. But I have to say right now I'm working on a project as we speak for a very large property in Malibu, Malibu, California. And it's by far the biggest project I've ever done. And why it's so satisfying for me is because it really fulfills everything that we've just been talking about right now. Clearly, there's a, a very large house on the property and um, and it's in a very, very exclusive, wealthy area. But there's so much land. It's three and a half acres. And it uh, it's giving me the opportunity to really work with nature. You know, if I'm working on a small property here in the city, I've got a you know, I've got dirt and I've got trees, but it's a, you know, it's a defined space where this I'm literally working um, on rolling hills, working with a stream. The ocean is right across the street, right across PCH. And I'm going to be doing a lot of native plantings to, again, bring in, uh, you know, uh, nature, bring in the native habitat and just do what I can to bring the space into nature. Uh, I, th I think the client, I know the client is very committed to this, but I don't remember if he ever, if he actually said anything to it in the brief in the beginning, but we, we really wanted to um, make the house feel like it was set in a natural environment. So when you walk out of the house, everything you experience feels like you're out in nature and you're not in, uh, you're not in somebody's backyard. You know what I mean? So the, the idea was to really, uh, integrate it uh, seamlessly into the natural landscape. And and flipping the the tables from your most recent project to the first project that you were sort of the creative lead on, were there any particularly memorable moments from that? <laughs> oh my gosh, so many. Um, I I can look back and I and and I did not know what I was doing. Like <laughs> I really I and you know and that's something to. Uh, that I'm a big proponent of. Sometimes you just have to jump in. You're not going to have to know everything. You're not going to have it all figured out. Um, I, I, I did know what I was doing and I was working with a professional uh, landscape contractor, but I, I quite literally did not know what I was doing. And I would obviously, if I was to do it today, I would have made a lot of different decisions based on, you know, 20 years of experience. But uh, looking back on it, it was, uh, I kind of chuckle at how much I did not know but I did it anyway. And that's how you get started. You know, if you, if you're an accountant or, a, or whatever you are, and, and no offense to accountants, but if you want to do something creative, you can't wait for the perfect moment. You're not going to know everything. You just have to start <laughs> and it will come. Yes. There's certainly an element of imposter syndrome in every creative yes. industry. Oh and yeah. In, in fact, we've had, Back in January 2021, in the first uh, online iteration of the Creativity Conference, uh, Nick Haroz did a, a wonderful talk about the imposter syndrome and his experience with it. And then in August, we had Louisa Winters talking about it as well. So, yeah. And that's a completely different field. And so everybody faces it, but it's yeah. just diving in, as you say, and uh, just saying, well, let's just do it anyway, regardless of yeah. how out of my depth I feel. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a tricky thing. And everybody does experience that. I certainly have many, many times. I still do, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm stretching now in a new direction. Um, here I am, you know, speaking, writing a book, creating an online course to teach landscape design because I want to reach more people. And uh, these are all new things for me. I'm, I'm a visual artist. I, I'm, I, I get holed up in my studio and I just work, but now I'm putting myself out there in a different way. And I totally feel like an imposter. But um, you just you just have to do it. You just have to at, at some point, everybody feels like that. And I think, you know, if, if you don't at some point feel like you're an imposter, then you're obviously not pushing yourself. You know, you're not you're not you're not stretching and, and creating something new and different. So that's a yeah, it's a good thing. <laughs> Embrace yeah, it. <laughs> that's a really good point. Yeah, you should. Uh, yeah, you're not doing enough if you're not feeling out of your depth, it's at least occasionally not maybe all the time yeah yeah you, it might be a little bit too stressful if you do it all <laughs> it's like that all the time yeah. <laughs> well before we wrap up here um you're planning to join us in iceland in reykjavik for the creativity conference in august um yes what what is uh most exciting for you about 
joining us in Iceland. I, I I'm very very excited when when uh, you know Maxim and I talked about it and confirmed it and everything. I I literally was doing backflips through my my home here. I was just so excited because well I mean given everything that I just told you about, I cannot wait to go to Iceland because it is a natural wonder. Yeah. I mean it is one of the wildest most diverse and beautiful places on the planet. So that that aspect is is uh, something I'm very much looking forward to. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to being around the other creatives, the the other the, the, the community that we're building here, meeting you in person and seeing Maxim again. I, I met Maxim, gosh, like three years ago, I think, at a party here in Los Angeles. And it'll be good to see him again. But I'm I, you know, the, the last conference that we did in August was interesting uh, and it was virtual like this call. I am so looking forward to doing it live and being there in person and expanding my talk and, and being able to, uh, uh, you know, just be a little more visceral and in, in touch and in contact. But uh, yeah, all those things I'm just super, super excited about. Amazing. Well, I can't wait to see you there. And hopefully right. anybody listening who has, has a ticket or plans on buying one, you too. Yeah. <laughs> That's about all the time we have, okay. Michael. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, and uh, yeah, make sure to check out Michael's website, his upcoming book and um, course, which sounds amazing. Yeah, the course will be ready by the by the conference. I'm hoping the book will be, but the talk will be based on what, it, what is in the book. So I'll at least talk about that some more. So incredible. Yeah. Well, thank you once again and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. All right. Thanks, Aiden. Good to see you.